We've talked about the basics of both classification and regression now, and it's time to talk about another set of tools called support vector machines. Now these tools have uh, both a classification and a regression story. Uh, although the classification work was done in the 1960s, uh, really the, the computational uh, capabilities of our computers really only sort of picked up enough in the 90s for us to really understand how important these techniques were. And, and in some sense, they're sort of uh, magical kinds of uh, mechanisms. Well, and we'll talk through that process. Support vector machines are fundamentally linear models, um, but as we've already seen, we can uh, add nonlinear pre-processing to our feature sets and, and then use our linear techniques to do our classification or our regression, uh, and yet still have something that looks like uh, nonlinear types of models. What's interesting about support vector machines, or at least one of the things that's interesting, is that we don't explicitly represent the model parameters. There's no explicit notion of our, our weights that we compute. Uh, instead, we really capture the, the functions that we use uh, for, uh, for querying, so either a decision surface or a regression surface. We capture that function uh, as a subset of the training samples. So, so we compute a weighted sum over a subset of the training samples. For the classification problem, it's set up in just the same way as we've already talked about. So we have a set of positive and negative examples uh, in our training set, and our task is to find a hyperplane that divides the, the positives from the negatives. And we want to be able to find the, the best possible hyperplane. And, and here, what we mean by best is that we like to, of course, find a hyperplane that separates those positives from the negatives, but we also want this hyperplane to be as far away as possible from all of the training points. And what we end up getting out of this desire is, is that we end up with a very wide margin, or at least we hope we end up with a very wide margin, where, where there's a very clear separation between positives and negatives, not little tiny epsilon changes that, that will cause a sample to flip from positive to, to negative. Okay, so let's first talk about some of the intuition here. So let me draw a feature space here. So this might be x0 by x1. And let me give you some positive examples. And a set of uh, negative examples. Now, there are lots of different uh, decision surfaces that we could draw here. We, we've talked about a, a set of those uh, already. So I could, for example, drop a decision surface uh, right here. I could drop it right here. I could drop it over here uh, or along, uh, along here. So that's, so that's one possibility. I could, I could also end up uh, draw, drawing decision surfaces uh, along, uh, along here. So that negative there is just below that uh, purple line. So, so both of these are viable decision surfaces in that they separate the positives from the negatives. But what we'd really like to get to, as we talked about, is, is one where we have a decision surface that is far away from our positives and negatives as possible. I didn't draw that quite the right place. I'm going to put it right, right here. Okay, so so this one, this particular decision surface, the green one, let me get the other ones out of the way here. So this is our decision surface. Everything to the left and up is positive. Everything to the, to the right and, and down is negative. But the other important property of this particular choice of a decision surface is that there's this region uh, around it that runs parallel to it, both to the bottom and to the top. such that our positives and negatives actually fall outside of these regions, uh, meaning that uh, all of our negative samples fall outside the, the lower region here. So they fall to the, uh, to, to the right and, and down of, uh, of this red line here. And the positive examples all fall to the left and up of this, this line here. 
and none of the samples fall within this margin here. So this is, we actually explicitly refer to this as our margin. And by making this margin really wide, what it means is that if we have a, a tiny amount of uh, error in our sampling, then it's really unlikely for a negative point to actually shift uh, from one category to another. So for example, uh, this negative point right here, if that were uh, to be missampled a little bit and show up, uh, say, over here instead, so the center is, is right there, we're still going to call this a negative example because it falls to the right of the green line. Okay, so our, our goal here is to, uh, to build a model that allows us to have the largest uh, margin possible. Okay, so let's, let's talk about formulating this from a mathematical perspective. So, our, so we have a, our data set, and right now we're going to focus on our uh, training set. And these are going to have, of course, our traditional input-output pairs. And we'll refer to these as xj, so x is a, a vector, and uh, yj. And yj, I, I use, I mapped that to zero and one in, in our previous lectures. Uh, in this case, what we're going to do is actually map it uh, a little bit differently. We'll still call it one if a positive example, but we'll map it to negative one uh, if negative. And that's going to make our, our mathematics work out a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Okay, so now let's let's talk about what a query looks like. So our y hat for uh, for some sample. So this could be from our training set. It could also be an independent uh, data set. We'll call that uh, negative. We'll call it negative if w transpose x j uh, plus b is less than zero and positive otherwise. So that's, so, so this W transpose xj plus b, this is our expression of that green line that we were talking about before. And, and it's the, the same sort of uh, formulation uh, as, as we talked about uh, earlier with classification. The, the only difference is that I'm being a little bit more consistent with the book in that I'm using this, this B variable. Um, in the earlier lectures, we called this WN, but, but they play very equivalent roles here. So now our learning objective is going to be, uh, the, the formulation is actually a little bit different than what we've seen before. Let me write it out and then we'll talk about what this uh, means. So we want to minimize uh, a cost function. We're going to minimize over W and B. What, what we mean by that is that, that we're going to write in a cost function here, and we want to select W and B so that, such that we minimize that cost function. And the cost function in this case is 1 half W transpose W. This is our regularization term that we saw before when we were talking, say, about ridge regression. However, we're not just minimizing these terms. We're, we're going to add some constraints. And I'm going to talk about the hard constraint formulation first. Uh, so subject to, and I'm going to deviate a little bit from what the book is doing here in terms of notation to be more consistent with what I've been doing. Uh, notation-wise. Let me write this out. Okay, so, so remember that our j's iterate from 0 to m minus 1, so that's this range here. We have a set of m constraints which look like this. So yj is our true label, so that's either positive or negative 1. What's in the parentheses is our expression of our decision boundary. And then we have this uh, inequality greater than or equal to one. 
And that's going to enforce our margin for us. And we'll talk about what that means. So let's, let's split this set of constraints up into the positive and negative cases. So for uh, yj is equal to one, what we mean by this is w transpose xj plus b is greater than or equal to one. For the negative cases, what we end up with is w transpose xj plus b is less than or equal to negative one. So what, what these constraints say is that all of our positive cases need to fall on the left-hand side of our red line here, and all of our negative cases need to fall on the right-hand side. And, and this expression here is just a, a more compact way of capturing both the positive and negative cases. Okay, so let's, let's do a, a quick example here to get a little bit more intuition and to talk about a couple of other quick points. So let's imagine that we have a scenario where we have the so W, we'll set W to equal to one and negative one and two, and we'll set B uh, equal to negative five here. So what does that look like on in our space here? So this is X zero here, this is X one. And our dividing line uh, corresponds to corresponds to the case where we have negative x zero plus two x one minus five is equal to zero. So let's draw in that uh, line here. When x zero is zero, then uh, if you work through this, x one is equal to two and a half. So that sits uh, at this point here. If x1 is equal to zero, so that means we're on, on this line here, this, this point here, that's the origin, zero, zero. If x1 is equal to zero, then that means that uh, x0 is equal to negative five, which is this point right here. And let's go ahead and draw that dividing line in. There we go. And I'll draw it in the other direction too. Just so we're, there we go. So, that, so that's our dividing line. Anything uh, to, to the upper part of this is going to be considered positive. Anything to the lower will be negative. So this equation here corresponds to this point here. Let's explore this uh, this uh, inequality here. In fact, let's explore the dividing line, which is when it's equal exactly to one. So let me write that uh, in here. So, so we have negative, negative x zero plus two x zero, oh, sorry, two x one minus five is equal to one. Again, if we if we work through this, if I set uh, x zero equal to zero, then x one comes out at three, so that gives us a point that's right here. And if x if uh, x one is equal to zero, then then x zero is equal to negative six, which is this point right here. So so this is a line that is parallel to to our red line. we go. And on the negative side, so this one here is this guy right here. And on the negative side, we have negative uh, x0 plus 2x1 minus 5 is equal to negative 1. And that turns out to be equal to uh, a surface that looks like this. It actually passes right there. I'll let you work that detail out. 
And likewise here. So that is this decision boundary here. So with this particular choice of uh, parameters, what we have is uh, our, our green line and our orange line, all of our positive cases have to fall uh, above the green line if, if we've satisfied all of our constraints anyway. And uh, all of our negative cases have to be equal to, uh, so sitting on this orange line, or they have to be uh, less than this line. All right, so next what I'd like to do is a, a small uh, transformation here. Let's imagine changing our parameters. So I'm going to set up our parameters. I'm going to choose them such that they're exactly half of what we had before. So now we have one half and one for W and our B is equal to negative five over two. So when we do this, um, what happens, uh, what happens to our decision surface here? So writing out this equation, we have one half X zero plus X one minus five over two is equal to zero. And let's ask what, what happens here. Um, let's start by setting x zero to zero. And if you uh, solve for this, then uh, what you end up with is x one is equal to five halves or two and a half, which is exactly the same uh, point. Let me write it in a different color so it's clear what I'm circling here. It's exactly this point right here. And if I imagine x1 to be uh, equal to 0, then what we end up with is uh, x0 at negative 5, which is exactly this point right here. So this equation here gives us exactly the same decision surface as we had here. So same decision surface. But now let's ask uh, the question about what happens to our green and our orange lines. So what we, what we now have is minus one half x zero plus x one minus five halves is equal to one. If we set x zero to zero and we solve for x one, what we end up with is uh, seven halves, which happens to uh, occur at this point right here. And if we imagine x1 at 0 and solve for x0, what we uh, actually end up with is uh, x0 being at negative 7, which is this point right here. So the line that we end up with uh, looks like this. And notice that it is, so, so this equation here gives us the pink line. Notice that that's uh, higher than, uh, than the green line. And likewise, if we work through uh, what happens on the negative side, x0, one half, minus one half x0 plus x1 minus five halves is equal to negative one, if, if one sets x0 to uh, 0, then x1 comes in at uh, this point right here, 1 and a half. And if we were to set x1 uh, equal to uh, 0, then we end up with an x0 uh, uh, an x zero that sits here at negative 3. So let's draw that one in. So to summarize what we've done here, we, we have, by, by changing our parameters from this set here, to this set here, we haven't changed our decision surface at all. But what we have done is we've changed the, the width of this margin here. So as, as our parameters got smaller, 
uh, the margin actually uh, got uh, bigger. So looking back at our optimization problem here, what, what this minimization is, is trying to do is that it's, it, it's trying to make that margin as wide as possible. Now, if we were just, if, if we were just uh, optimizing this cost function, then we'd push those Ws down to uh, zero. But the important thing to remember is that we are subject to, our, our final solution is subject to these hard constraints. Again, our positives have to fall uh, above the, say, the pink uh, line here, and the negatives have to fall uh, below the, the blue line. And, and so what this ultimately means is that the, the algorithm is going to be looking for a, uh, a margin that is, that is big, as, as big as possible. There are going to be some positives and some negatives that end up falling right on the margin. And, and that's going to define how big the margin is. And then there will be lots of positives and lots of negatives that fall far away from our, our margin lines here. And, uh, it, and what it ultimately what we're going to learn is that it really doesn't matter exactly uh, that, that set of points that are far away from the margin. They don't actually define where this margin lives, where the decision surface is or where the margin lives. What matters are the points that, are, that sit right along that margin. So before we go any further, uh, what I'd like to do next is talk a little bit about quadratic programming, which turns out to be the computational engine that allows us to solve uh, this type of a, a minimization problem.